The Earth as we know it consists of seven continents and four oceans. But Earth did not always look this way. In fact, as many as four different times in the history of Earth, all of Earth's land masses have been combined into a single united supercontinent. The last of those supercontinents, and the one that's had the most profound effect on life as we know it, was known as Pangaea. In this episode, we're going to talk about the rise and the fall of Pangaea and the impact that it has on living species today and had on living species back then. This will be one of our first videos we're talking about the topic of biogeography. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Earth as we know it today has been shaped by hundreds of millions of years of geologic movement. If we were to go back in time, over 200 million years ago, we wouldn't see the seven continents that we see today, or the four oceans that we have on today's maps. Instead, what we would see is a single landmass known as Pangaea, and a single ocean known as the Panthalassic Ocean. Over the past 200 million years or so, that supercontinent has slowly broken apart to shape the Earth and make it look like it does today. But Pangaea wasn't the only time that all of Earth's land existed as a single united supercontinent. In fact, there was one that preceded it a few hundred million years before Pangaea known as Pinocchio. But Pangaea is the one that's had the most profound impact on life as we know it. Because prior to Pangaea, life really hadn't been present on terrestrial land. So when Pinocchio existed during the late Cryogenian and into the Ediacaran period, life existed strictly in the ocean. So there was no major effect on species when that single landmass began to break up. However, by the time that Pangaea was established during the Carboniferous period and the time it broke up in the middle of the Jurassic, life had slowly climbed its way into terrestrial environments. And as that supercontinent broke up, it resulted in widespread geographic isolation leading to large amounts of speciation events and shaping life as we know it today. So where did Pangaea come from and how did Pangaea form and eventually break up? Well, to understand this, we have to understand a little bit about tectonic plate theory. What you have to picture with the Earth is the Earth it has several different layers to it. The place where we stand is on a very, very thin layer of crust. And this crust rides atop of a liquid mantle, which is made up of, quite literally, magma. This is what comes out of volcanoes when a volcano erupts. And these tectonic plates sort of float around on top of that liquid magma. And they move about the surface of the Earth very slowly, separating from each other, bumping into each other, going under each other, rubbing up against each other. And all of this tectonic movement leads to lots of geologic consequences, things like earthquakes, the formation of mountain ranges, the subduction of one plate under another, and volcanic activity are all the result of the movement of these tectonic plates over the liquid mantle. Now, every so often, the rearrangement of these tectonic plates leads land to, be, to collide with itself. It leads different continents to combine to form a single continent. And this is, in fact, what happened during the late Ordovician period. See, Pinocchio had broken up at the end of the Ediacaran towards the beginning of the Cambrian. It had broken up into several different distinct land masses. But during the late uh, Ordovician period, just as life was really starting to climb onto land in the first place, the first event in the formation of Pangaea would happen. The first event in the creation of Pangaea would occur during the late Ordovician period, just as life was really starting to climb on the land. We see the first evidence that perhaps plants were beginning to establish themselves on land. This event occurred through the formation of a continent known as Euramerica. Three separate land masses collided with themselves to combine to form Euramerica. This event also led to the creation of the Northern Appalachian Mountains, which now reside in the eastern part of the United States. A few million years later, during the Silurian period, that continent of Euramerica would, would bump into and combine with a southern continent known as Gondwana. This would, by the way, create the 
southern Appalachian Mountains that we see in the southeastern parts of the United States of America. The final event in the creation of Pangaea would occur during the Carboniferous period. This would involve the, the, the continent of Kazakhstania, which includes modern, much of modern day Asia and Russia, would collide with Euramerica and Gondwana, creating the Euro Mountains. And from that point forward, uh, we would have the establishment of a supercontinent known as Pangaea, where the majority of all of Earth continental land masses were combined into a single supercontinent. Now, by the late Carboniferous, this would have a profound effect on life as it existed on land, because by the Carboniferous period, we had begun to establish, or life, I should say, had begun to establish itself on land. By the Carboniferous period, we have the first true tetrapods. We have amphibians. We're beginning to see reptiles appear in the fossil record. Life was establishing itself firmly on land. Both plants and animals, vertebrates and invertebrates, had made their way onto land. But the creation of Pangaea would have massive effects on life itself. And one of the main reasons has to do with what life on Earth would have had to experience when you have a single united landmass representing all of the land on the planet. If we look at what we can observe through the geologic history of Pangaea, life on Pangaea was a life of extremes. With all of the land being a single continent, with a ring of mountains sort of separating the, the lush coastal exterior of, of Pangaea to the dry, arid central portion, which was most likely a, a large, central continental desert, kind of like we see with Australia, we see that the majority of life was probably crammed into the coastal regions simply because it was the most hospital, hospitable part of the supercontinent, while as the interior was very dry and desert-like. But life on the coast was no piece of cake, and one of the reasons why is having a single large ocean allowed for massive storm systems to be created out in the ocean before smashing into land. And it is quite likely that life which existed on the continental portion of Pangaea had to deal with seasonal mega monsoons, significantly larger than any monsoons that we see on modern day Earth. Large super cyclones that would be significantly more impactful and powerful than any hurricane or typhoon that we see on the planet Earth today. This would have greatly influenced the way life had to survive. So even though we have a single united landmass, allowing the free movement of species across the, 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 all of, of terrestrial biomes, it likely wasn't that easy to survive. And there were likely large parts of the continent that were cut off from itself by mountain ranges or changing biomes that were either hospitable or inhospitable, depending on what the species were at the time. So what evidence do we have that Pangaea existed in the first place? And what evidence do we have about when it was created, when it began to break apart, and the effects that it had on life? Well, there is a host of evidence uh, that, supplies, that supports the fact that Pangaea did exist and tells us approximately when it was created and when it began to fall apart. First off, we can turn to Steno's, uh, Steno's Laws of Stratigraphy. We can look at the rock layers that exist on now separate continents. And we can see when those rock layers matched up. So if you remember the, the principle of, of, of lateral continuity, basically stating that rock layers are laid down continuously. Well, if you look at rock layers on South America and you can match them with rock layers found in Africa up to a certain point, you can date those rock layers and say, okay, well, the rock layers match starting at this point in geologic history and they stop matching after this point in geologic history. And that gives you a pretty good indication of when South America and Africa were combined with each other. You can do the same thing across all of the continents. Compare North America to Europe or North America to Asia. And see when those rock sheets or when those strata line up and when they stop lining up. And that gives you a pretty good timeline for when those rock layers were either combined as a single continent or when they began to break apart. There's also evidence from a field uh, called paleomagnetism. Most rocks have some type of metallic inclusion in them. And these metal fragments are actually polarized in accordance with their alignment to the North and South Pole due to the Earth's magnetic field. Well, these become fixed when the rock is created. So you can see which part of the rock was pointing North and which part of the rock was pointing South 
as that rock layer was created. And now you can see where it exists today. And you can see how it's turned on its axis. It's now turned 45 degrees relative due to its magnetism compared to true north. You can tell that that rock has actually turned that particular place that rock exists has actually turned about 45 degrees relative to when it was created relative to the North Pole. So paleomagnetism provides a good deal of evidence for following how these continents moved uh, and drifted apart from each other over geologic history. But one of the most profound pieces of evidence we have in terms of Pangaea existing and how it fell apart and when it did actually comes from the fossil record. If you recall the fossil record or index fossils more specifically, was how many of the rock layers were actually identified and tracked during the early days of mapping geologic rock strata. Well, these same fossils also provide us with a wealth of evidence. So for example, we have evidence that of a species called Sinonathus. Now Sinonathus was a Triassic land reptile. Now we find Sinonathus actually spread apart across fossils spread across several continents from Africa all the way down to South America. Now there's no way that Sinonathus would have ever been able to make it across the Atlantic Ocean. It was not capable of swimming. There's just no way based on its body plan. And we stopped finding Sinonathus fossils at a certain point in time when the species went extinct. But we can also tell that when Sinonathus existed, and we can date those rocks, we can tell that when Sinonathus existed, that for a fact, Africa and South America were a single united continent rather than being two continents separated by 3,000 miles of the South Atlantic Ocean. Another Triassic land reptile, Lystrosaurus, is, its fossil remains are now found spread across many of the southern continents, including Africa, Australia, and Antarctica, and modern-day India. Again, those continents are no longer in contact with each other. Well, the majority of them, India is in contact with Asia now. But they're no longer in contact with each other. However, at the time when Pangaea existed, they represented what will become the southern continent of Gondwana. They were all interconnected. Therefore, the dispersal pattern of these fossils makes perfect sense if you go back to the Triassic era, when all these continents were joined as part of the southern portion of Pangaea. However, now, of course, they're now separated by thousands of miles of ocean and spread amongst the South Pole, over where Australia is, and now where modern-day Africa and India are. But perhaps the best example comes from a fern known as Glossopteris, which existed back at the same time. Glossopteris, the dispersal pattern, is very, very odd. The dispersal pattern of its fossils is very, very odd. We find it spread across the southern parts of India. We find it spread across uh, Western Australia, Africa, even in Antarctica. Do we find the fossil remains of this fern? Now, of course, this fern could never have existed in modern-day Ant Africa. It simply wouldn't be able to exist there. Nor is it possible that this plant was dispersed by wind or by sea. We know what its fossilized seeds look like. They were too dense to float. They were certainly too heavy to be brought by air. And there's no way an animal carried them there, again, because of their size, their shape, and their density. So the bottom line is the only way that this weird dispersal pattern of Glossopteris fossils makes sense is if we reconstruct the continents the way the geology tells us to at the time of Pangaea. And if we do that, we actually see a nice distribution pattern that focuses around the southern portion, a ring around the southern portion of Pangaea. Now, why might there be a ring shape? Well, evidence to explain that actually comes from more geologic data. Geologic data indicates on the southern portions of modern-day South America, Africa, portions of Australia, and India, there is uh, rock remnants of a southern ice cap during Pangaea times. Much like the Glossopteris fossils, the dispersal pattern of these glacial remains isn't particularly sensible if the Earth looked like it did today. But the fact of the matter is it didn't. And when you reconstruct the continents as they must have existed during, during Pangaea, according to the geologic data, you can see that that distribution pattern of glacial remnants actually aligns perfectly with what would be a southern polar ice cap. And just outside of those glacial remains, you will find the distribution ring that correlates with Glossopteris fossils. What's most interesting in terms of the field of biogeography is when we look at biogeography, 
we see that we have fossil evidence that supports geologic evidence, and we see geologic evidence as agreement with the fossil evidence. There's no reason that these two fields should have to agree with each other. But the fact of the matter is they corroborate each other simply because they are interdependent. And it helps to prove exactly what we understand about the world that we know. That sometime in the neighborhood of, sometime for a period of about 200 million years, from the late Carboniferous to the middle of the, tri tri uh, the, middle of the Jurassic period, all of life lived on a single continental landmass known as Pangaea. But as with all good things, they must come to an end. And around the mid-Jurassic is when Pangaea began to break apart. Those geologic forces that had created and held Pangaea together for over 200 million years began working against the continent, and the continent began to fall apart. Now, we're going to the mid-Jurassic, going back to around 210 million years ago. Back when dinosaurs were ruling the earth, reptiles owned the land, they owned the air, and they owned the sea. They were the dominant species on the planet. But the earth below them wasn't stable. It began rapidly falling apart. The first major step happened around 175 million years ago. It helps to explain a lot of the distribution patterns that we see on life today. The first major step was the separation of a northern continent known as Laurasia which includes modern-day North America, Europe, and Asia. Laurasia kind of began rotating away from what would become a southern continent known as Gondwana, which is made up of Africa, Australia, Antarctica, South America, and modern-day India. And it began rotating almost like it was kind of taking its hat off the top. And in doing so, helped to create the northern Atlantic Ocean. Now, one of the things this helps to explain is why in the fossil record, and even today, there is a north-south difference between the species. Because the first major split that happened was to separate into two continents, a northern continent, Laurasia, and a southern continent, Gondwana. And it helps to explain why many of the species in the southern continents, South America, Africa, Antarctica, and Australia, share more similarity than they do with, with other species in the Northern Hemisphere, North America, Europe, and Asia, simply because the first split when Pangaea broke up was along a North-South axis. And these continents would remain out of contact with each other for over 100 million years before some of those reconnections began to occur. The next major event started happening about 25 million years after that, so 150 million years ago during the early Cretaceous. This is when the southern supercontinent of Gondwana would start to fall apart. Africa and South America would start to move in a northeasterly direction, separating themselves, or partially separating themselves, from what would become India and modern-day Australia and Antarctica. Soon, South America would separate from Africa, creating the Southern Atlantic Ocean. Africa at this point would actually become pretty much an island, only attached to what is now modern day Madagascar and India. South America, on the other hand, the Southern tip of it would remain in contact with Antarctica and Australia, with Antarctica interacting on both ends with South America and Australia, kind of serving as a land bridge connecting the two. You can almost think of, of Gondwana falling apart a bit like a blooming onion, where it's sort of folding outwards like this, with South America, Antarctica, and Australia here, and Africa sitting in the middle. By the early Cenozoic era, about 60 million years ago, North America and Greenland would be pushing westward, and they would separate from modern-day Europe and Asia, eventually giving rise to Greenland and then modern-day North America. In the southern hemisphere, we're going to start to see Africa shift and start moving northeastward. Eventually, it's going to collide with Europe, creating the Alps. South America is going to continue to push towards the west. It's going to begin stretching itself, and eventually, around 90 million years ago, it's going to lose its connection with Antarctica. Antarctica, on the other hand, is still continuing to track south, while Australia is pushing towards the east.
Australia would eventually lose contact with Antarctica somewhere around 35 to 45 million years ago. India, on the other hand, about 90 million years ago, broke away from Africa and what could only be the equivalent of a continental sprint, somehow made it, across the, made it across the Indian Ocean in just around 50 million years, eventually slamming into Asia, the southern part of Asia. And that is why India is known as a supercontinent, because it was kind of its own tiny little continent that raced across the Indian Ocean and now is in the process of actually slamming into Asia as we know it. And to give you a concept of how slow most of these geologic processes occurs, the Himalayan mountains are the tallest mountain on the planet because they're still being built. India is still technically in the midst of its slow collision with the Asian continent. And each year, the Himalayan mountains grow by around by a few inches. In other words, if you're going to go climb Mount Everest, every year you wait, it gets a little bit harder because the Himalayan mountains are still being built. Madagascar, in the meantime, got left behind about 90 million years ago, uh, just off the coast of Africa and reaching isolation about 55 to 60 million years ago, uh, losing uh, all contact with, with other continents. The separation of South America and then later on uh, Australia from Antarctica had a profound impact on the planet, in particular that, that continent. One of the things you have to realize is up until the point that Antarctica became isolated, it wasn't this icy snowball at the bottom of, uh, of, of the globe. In fact, it was probably much more akin to a boreal forest. The continental connections it had with South America and then at the very end, uh, still remaining with Australia until about 35 million years ago, prevented something called a circumpolar current from forming. But it was this circumpolar current that allowed water to be trapped at, at the bottom of the Earth to circulate and continue to cool and to freeze Antarctica into the frozen barren place that it is today. But up until about 35 million years ago, it was actually quite a hospitable uh, place to live on the planet. 35 million years ago, however, Australia broke free, began heading east. It will eventually, in tens of millions of years, slam into probably somewhere around Korea or Vietnam and become part of Asia when the continents begin to reunite. About that time, North America will also be arriving and uh, you'll be able to uh, you know, walk from, from North America uh, into Australia and then eventually into Asia uh, as we all combine back into a single supercontinent. South America uh, began to break from, from Antarctica and move in a northwesterly direction. About 10 million years ago, Earth would rapidly cool. And the cooling of the Earth would lead to ice caps forming at the South Pole uh, in Antarctica and at the North Pole as well. And this frozen uh, this frozen water would begin to slowly cause ocean levels to drop. And the drop of these ocean levels would allow a small um, underwater archipelago uh, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to begin to dry up and actually become dry land, forming what is now modern-day Central America. And this would now allow a land bridge to form between North and South America. And for the first time in um, over 150 million years, would species actually be able to go from South America into North America? So as you can see, why Pangaea had such a profound impact on life and why it's probably the most important supercontinent to life itself. It's because it was the formation and then the breakup of this supercontinent that led to massive amounts of geographic isolation. It led to speciation events. It changed the way species on this planet evolved in ways that we can't possibly comprehend. But it also helps to explain what we see in both the geologic record and the fossil record. It helps to explain why, for example, there is a north-south variation in species, not an east-west one, because, it, because Pangaea didn't fall apart along an eastern western axis, but it fell apart along a north-south axis. The story of Pangaea provides us with a great introduction into the topic of biogeography. It helps explain how we're able to follow uh, the movement of continents over time and how that helps to explain species distribution. But one of the cool things about it is species distribution also serves as evidence for those geologic changes. Biogeography is a great combination of both the fields of biology and geology, 
and shows how two fields that are in many ways unrelated can actually help to corroborate the evidence from each of those fields to form a unified theory to explain the way species exist, the way species evolved, and the way the Earth changed over time. In our next few episodes, we'll talk about how biogeography works, uh, talk more about how we study biogeography, and what we've learned from biogeography. So stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you learned a lot.